Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm one of the reference librarians with the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. I work primarily at the Adrian's Memorial Library in the city of Poughkeepsie, but you'll also see me at our Boardman Road Branch Library in the town. In the last two years, our library district has increased the number of programs presented by local health organizations. During that time, we've heard from the Mid-Hudson Regional Hospital, Vassar Brothers Medical Center, the New York State Department of Health, Dutchess County Office for the Aging, Cornell Cooperative, the Poughkeepsie Farm Project, Duchess Outreach, the Culinary Institute of America, HRH Care, New York Connects, and End of Life Choices New York, to name a few. Interested in presenting programs that are relevant to our community, the Poughkeepsie Public Library District is always looking to collaborate with other organizations, so continue to check our events calendar for new programs and offerings. To view our events calendar, you'll need to visit the library's website at poklib.org. From there, hold your mouse over the events tab and click on calendar of events and programs. Scroll down to view a daily listing of programs and events. Click on the date for a week view. You can also choose from the drop down menu listed under show all events for specific types of programs like health and wellness, for example. In addition to our regularly scheduled health programs, I'd also like to quickly highlight some of the other resources available from the Poughkeepsie Public Library and the Mid-Hudson Library System. Click on Search Catalog, generally found at the top of the screen. The tabs look a little different right now to highlight e-services available. Adrian's Memorial Library is a central library within 66 libraries located in Dutchess, Columbia, Green, Putnam, and Ulster counties, making up the Mid-Hudson Library System. Click on the first tab, Libraries, to view a list by county or alphabetically. Search the online catalog by title, author, or keywords, and then call to request materials. Once services are fully restored, you'll be able to request the materials from any of the libraries in the Mid-Hudson Library System and have them delivered to the library most convenient to you, directly from the online catalog. Under Books and More, select eLibrary. Download the app and create an account using your library card to stream or download ebooks, audiobooks, documentaries, and more. While OverDrive and the Libby app are offered to all libraries within the Mid-Hudson Library System, your library may not support all the services you'll see on our website. Visit your library's website or contact them to learn more. Under the Learn tab, select Online Resources and Databases. Databases are organized alphabetically by name or by subject. Using your library card, you can access a number of databases from home. If your library doesn't subscribe to the database you see on our website, when services are fully restored, feel free to visit the Adrian's or Boardman Road libraries, no appointment necessary, and use a public computer to access those databases. If you find a citation for a health article but can't read the full text, contact our reference desk and ask about requesting a medical interlibrary loan. Also under the Learn tab towards the bottom are Tuesday's Tips and Guides. There are two health-related guides included here the e-resources for consumer health, and the caregiver's resources. Choose from the tabs at the top of the guide. First one, for example, general materials and services, which also includes the extension services offered by the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. 
Uh, there's a variety of resources listed, including video, books, and under elder care and terminal care, there's actually a promotional video for a virtual presentation that was given May 21st on end of life care. That should be enough to get you started. Please feel free to contact me or call 845-485-3445 and follow the prompts to the reference desk for more information. I would like to thank you for attending our virtual program and I would like to hand it over to Lillian to introduce our program and speaker. Thank you, Bridget. Um, would you mind stopping screen share for me? Wonderful. Great, so we're excited to be offering this webinar with the Poughkeepsie Library. Um, my name is Lillian Maron. I am the Director of Outreach and Education at End of Life Choices New York. Before turning it over to David, who I will introduce in a moment, I'd like to go over some housekeeping and tell you about my organization. After David finishes his presentation, we will have time to answer your questions. To, answer, to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box below at the bottom of your screen at any time. In the Q&A box, we'll have a link to the documents David will be mentioning in his talk. It should be under answered or it should be visible to you. If it's not, please ask that in the box. David will not be using slides during his talk, but don't worry about taking notes because we are recording the presentation and the recording will be made available to you. So now a bit about my nonprofit organization, End of Life Choices New York. We are the leading organization in New York working to improve end-of-life care, expand end-of-life options, all to ensure peaceful death. We do this by educating the public and healthcare professionals on end-of-life issues, by providing free counseling and support to people who are preparing advanced directives, caring for a terminally ill loved one, or who are approaching the end-of-life themselves. Our services include a new healthcare proxy hotline, which I will discuss more at the end of the talk. And we also pursue legal and legislative reform to ensure a patient's right to a peaceful death, including implementation and enforcement of advanced directives, pain and symptom management, and legalization of medical aid in dying. So without further ado, I will introduce David. David Levin is a lawyer serving as Executive Director Emeritus and Senior Consultant at End of Life Choices New York. He is a leading advocate for patients and an expert on advanced care planning, patient rights, palliative care, and end-of-life issues. David has played a key role in having legislation introduced and enacted in New York to improve pain, palliative, and end-of-life care, including the Palliative Care Information Act. He lectures frequently to diverse professional groups, students, and the general public, and is a regular guest lecturer at the College of New Rochelle School of Nursing and Fordham Graduate School of Social Service a graduate of the University of Rochester and Syracuse University College of Law. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Public Interest Law Award of the New York State Bar Association and Public Interest Law Committee. So David, you are unmuted and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Lillian, and thank you, Bridget, for, for hosting this event at the Poughkeepsie Library. Uh, thanks for attending this evening. I know how difficult these times are for all of us. And I hope all of you and your family members and loved ones uh, are doing well and can, will continue to do well. I just want to uh, further introduce myself a little bit and tell you a little bit about my legal background because it's, it's relevant, I think, to my talk this evening. Um, I have always been involved in justice issues during my legal career, which stems over 50 years now. Uh, I'm so old that I actually went to law school with Joe Biden. Uh, we were in the same class at Syracuse. Um, so I was a legal services for the poor lawyer for 10 years, seeking justice for poor people. And then I was the executive director of Prisoners Legal Services of New York, representing prisoners in our state prison system and seeking justice for prisoners. And then for the last 18 years, I've been working with End of Life Choices in New York, seeking health justice for patients. Um, I care deeply about justice issues. I care deeply about human suffering, and I hate human suffering. And there is too much of it uh, in for poor people, too much of it for prisoners, and too much of it for patients as well. So we're going to cover a lot of ground in the next 40 minutes or so. 
Uh, I'm going to be referring to a number of documents which you have. Uh, and I hope that you this uh, program will be of some help to you uh, as you think about planning for uh, your health care and particularly for the end of life. And this also, and think about this in terms of your family members. I don't know how old you are, uh, what, but most of you look quite young to me, even though I can't see any of you, um, and probably in your 20s or 30s. But this really, what we're talking about applies to everyone. So let's talk about um, getting your health care wishes respected. Uh, how many of you want to get your health care wishes respected? Yeah, all of you. And how many of you think you're eventually going to die? Well, actually, I've done a lot of research on the issue of mortality, and every report, every study shows that we have a 100% mortality rate. And what that means is that it's not a question as to whether we're going to die, but how we're going to die, and are we going to be able to die consistent with our own preferences, values, and goals of care. So I don't know how many of you have a health care proxy. Um, probably a few of you do. I would suspect a number of you don't because most people have never gone through the process of having discussions with their loved ones and then appointing someone to be their healthcare agent to make decisions for them when they can no longer make decisions for themselves. Now, as long as we have decision-making capacity, we are able to make all of our own healthcare decisions, whatever we want or don't want. Doctors and other healthcare professionals can recommend certain treatments and so forth, but it's up to us to decide whether we want those treatments or not. We can accept or refuse any treatment that is offered to us at any time, whether it's ordinary treatment or extraordinary treatment, whether it's life-sustaining treatment or not. It does not matter. As long as we have decision-making capacity, we are in control of the decision-making process when it comes to health care. But unfortunately, 70% of us will eventually lose the ability to make our own health care decisions. And what that means, of course, is that someone else is going to have to make those decisions for us. Well, obviously, we, if we want our dis health care decisions respected, then other folks have to know what our goals of care are, what our preferences are, what our, uh, what our values are, and what kinds of treatment we would want or not want given various circumstances. So in New York, we have what's called a healthcare proxy. It's a simple two-page document which can be easily completed. Uh, and what you do is appoint someone to be your healthcare agent, someone who's 18 years of age or older, to make healthcare decisions for you when you can no longer make healthcare decisions for yourself as determined by a doctor. If it's about life-sustaining treatments, then two doctors have to make the determination that you do not have decision-making capacity. You can also appoint someone to be your alternate agent. And in fact, you can probably appoint even more than one person to be alternate agents. So let's think about what you would want to do in considering who might be an appropriate healthcare agent. It needs to be someone 18 or over. It should be someone that you trust to make decisions that would be consistent with your values and wishes, even if they might not agree with those, those wishes. It should be someone who also is going to be a strong advocate for you. You can advocate with healthcare professionals, and also can deal with conflict, which could potentially arise either with healthcare professionals or with family members. So it can be, if you're married, it could be your spouse. Uh, the right person for me, I think, is my spouse because she is an expert in this field. She taught it for many years as an elder law professor at Turo Law School. But for others, it might be someone else. It might not be your spouse. Maybe it's an adult child or a sibling or a close friend. So for my alternate, I had appointed a close friend, but for some reason, he seemed to be in denial about thinking in terms of death and dying. 
and he was not completing his own healthcare proxy. So a few years ago, I decided that it was time now to ask my adult daughter, who's now in her 30s, if she would be interested uh, in being my healthcare agent alternate, and she agreed to do so. So you have to think about these things in terms of who might be best for you to appoint, who will be the one that can carry out your decisions as you would want them carried out, and who's going to be a strong, a strong advocate for you. But you need to have discussions before completing this document. You need to discuss what makes life worth living for you, what would not make life worth living for you, what is important to you in terms of living, and whether or not quality of care is more important than extend, an extended life. For most of us, at some point, we would say, well, I would rather have a better quality of life than an extended life with a lot of suffering. But most of us can endure some suffering, some disability, and so we need to draw lines as to where we would want continued treatment and where we would not want continue, continued treatment. Some of us might never want to be intubated. And with COVID-19, we have to realize that many people who get sick, especially older folks, are going to be intubated and will need a ventilator. And 50% or more of those people who are on a ventilator will never um, survive. So those are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about as you discuss these issues with your loved ones and the person that you're ultimately going to appoint to be your health care agent. Some people will be able to will say, I'm, I'd be very happy continuing to live forever, even with a great deal of suffering, because the, that's consistent with my values. And again, this is all about respecting your health care wishes, whatever they might be. Others might say, I don't want to ever be on a ventilator or a feeding tube, even if it's temporary. Although some people might say, well, on a temporary basis, that would be okay either one of those things. The same with dialysis. If you needed dialysis daily, maybe that would be too much for you. But maybe if you had it, needed it three days a week, that would be okay. So again, something to think about. And now is the time also to be talking with your doctors, especially once you've completed the healthcare proxy document. You should give a copy to close family members and loved ones, as well as to relevant doctors. So my cardiologist and my primary care doctor both have my healthcare proxy and they understand what my wishes are. You also want to keep it in a place where it's going to be easily found, hopefully more than one place. I have mine and my wife's on, on my cell phone and she has mine as well. My daughter also has my healthcare proxy on her cell phone. And by the way, um, as I said earlier, People 18 years and older can complete the document as well as be your healthcare agent. So uh, if you have children or grandchildren who are 18 or over, it's never too early to complete this document to go through this process. We did it with our children when they were in their 20s because we thought it was important. Why? Because anything can happen to any of us at any time. And in fact, all the leading cases involve young people in their late teens or early 20s who lost decision-making capacity, but in fact did not have a healthcare proxy and did not, had not appointed someone to be their healthcare agent. So it's extremely important to do this. And you should make copies. My wife and I also have a copy of our healthcare proxies on our refrigerator. That's where people also put their uh, do not resuscitate order if they have one. So think about making copies, having these discussions with loved ones, and then going th through the process of appointing someone to be your healthcare agent, making copies so that those copies can be found when, when needed. And talking with your doctors so they understand as well what your values are, what your preferences are, what your goals of care would be in very, under various circumstances. So let me just give you an example as to why this is so important to do because let's assume you're 105 years old now. None of you look that old, but at some point maybe you might be. You're 105, you are bedridden, 
you're incontinent, you have not had decision-making capacity for years, you cannot communicate at all, and now you come down with pneumonia. And the question arises as to whether or not we should try to cure the pneumonia with antibiotics, with, with penicillin, whatever. Well, let's say you have a son and a daughter. They're now the, your babies in their 70s. Well, your loving daughter might say, you know, mom has always been a fighter. Let's give her the antibiotics and let's just keep her going. Your loving son, who loves you just as much, might say, you know, mom has suffered too much. Look at what condition she's in. She has really had enough. Let's just give her good palliative care and let her go peacefully. But well, who's right? We don't know who's right if mom, you have never communicated your wishes to your children. And now your children are going to be in conflict. And these conflicts arise all the time when loved ones do not know the wishes of the patient who has now lost decision-making capacity and needs to have healthcare decisions made for them. So think about that example as you think about going through this process and how really important it is. So if there's anyone at all that you can appoint to be your healthcare agent, go through the process. The healthcare proxy document has a lot of good information on it in terms of what needs to be completed and how it's to be completed, it has questions and answers. Uh, I'm available too if you ever have any questions you want to raise uh, with me about it. You can reach me on my cell phone at 914-907-6156 or at my email address, David C. Levin, L -E -V -E -N, at AOL.com. If you have no one to appoint as your healthcare agent, and hopefully all of you do, then what comes into play if you've lost decision-making capacity and healthcare decisions need to be made is the Family Healthcare Decisions Act. And that act has a hierarchy of people who are going to be looked at to make healthcare decisions for you if you've lost decision-making capacity. It starts with a guardian or a spouse or domestic partner and then an adult uh, child, then sibling, then close friend or close, uh, other close relatives or a friend. But that person who is chosen to make those decisions for you may not be the same person that you would have chosen if you had, the, had appointed someone to be your healthcare agent. And they're probably not going to know what your wishes are, what your values are. So they may be making dis decisions blindly, uh, even though they're trying to do the right thing for you. So you really don't want to have to rely on the Family Health Care Decisions Act. If you do not have anybody to appoint as your health care agent, or even if you do, you might want to complete a living will. But living wills can be very difficult to interpret. So while some of them are quite good, and we have a model living will on our website, uh, there's also a New York State form that's not a, um, it's not a legal form because while living wills are recognized, uh, if they provide clear and convincing evidence of what a person's wishes are, there is no legal form in New York State pursuant, pursuant to any law. So you may want to complete a living will. If you do, my recommendation is that you only give it to those people who might be making healthcare decisions for you and not to healthcare providers unless the provider raises questions of the healthcare agent as to whether or not the agent is acting in good faith in accordance with your wishes, and then hopefully it will clarify things for the healthcare agent. Another document uh, which you should consider, particularly if you might be in your 70s or 80s and have a heart condition or other conditions, uh, which might mean that at some point in the relatively near future you could have uh, heart failure. Um, or serious respiratory problems is a do not resuscitate order. And you should discuss this with your doctor. Why? Doctors will not ordinarily raise this issue with you. Uh, why? Because most healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, um, social workers, while they've been trained really, really well and do an excellent job in terms of providing high quality treatment to their patients, most of them have never been trained in end-of-life care or having difficult end-of-life dis discussions with their patients. So it's something that you might raise with your healthcare professional doctor or nurse practitioner. 
even better than the do not resuscitate order if your doctor or nurse practitioner or now physician assistant, at least as of June, uh, can, can be involved with is the medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. This document, which has now been in effect in New York since 2008, provides a number of different options that you can choose with regard to life-sustaining treatment, starting with resuscitation. And as you can see, if you look at the document on the first page, you can choose to either be resuscitated or not to be resuscitated, your choice. On the second page, there are all kinds of decisions that you can make with regard to comfort care, with regard to intubation, where there are several different checkoffs, with regard to artificial nutrition and hydration, there are also se several checkoffs for that, with regard to being provided antibiotics, or with regard to being provided um, any other treatments or care that you might want and that you might want to include in this document. Uh, there's also a provision with regard to rehospitalization. Some people don't want to be hospitalized again at some point in time. And so this is a really good document for people who might be expected or might reasonably be expected to die within the next year, who are in a nursing home or need nursing home care, or it can be completed by anybody who wants to express their wishes with regard to life-sustaining treatments, whatever their condition or whatever their age. And then it's signed by the healthcare professional, physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant. And so it becomes a medical order. And what that means is that it's much more likely to be respected uh, than uh, if a healthcare agent is just talking without having this document as well. Combined together, it is hopeful that the, the patient, a patient's wishes will be respected. Uh, and also think about if this document is going to be completed with your healthcare professional, have your healthcare agent present at the same time to make sure that everything is consistent in terms of decision making. There are still unfortunately some doctors and nurse practitioners who don't recognize or will not complete the, the medical orders for life-sustaining treatment form with you. And if that's the case, you can still complete it and give it to your healthcare agent so he or she will have it and understand what your wishes are in ver with regard to various treatments. So that again, if and when decisions have to be made, there is a record of what you would want or not want. Okay, so let's move on and talk about palliative care. There was a survey done just last year, which showed that 70% of citizens who took this survey across the country in the United States did not know what palliative care is. It's a relatively new field, but it's been around now for some 20 years. And palliative care is basically care that's provided to seriously ill patients who do not have to be terminally ill, but generally are going to be relatively seriously ill to enhance their quality of life as well as the quality of life of their family members. So it's usually provided by a team, a palliative care team in a hospital or nursing home uh, setting consisting of a doctor or nurse practitioner, a social worker, a chaplain. There can also be different kinds of therapists involved. Uh, and it's really to provide holistic care to a person, again, to help improve their quality of life in term with regard to addressing symptoms such as pain, uh, breathlessness, diarrhea, whatever those symptoms may be, but also to address psychosocial issues, anxiety and depression, uh, spiritual issues, and so forth. So it's really an excellent tool that's provided for patients to improve their quality of life as they're going through this illness, which ordinarily is serious, but does not necessarily have to be. You might be seriously injured in the hospital after, after an accident. You are suffering. You have a lot of pain. You might be depressed. You might have, be suffering from anxiety. Whatever it is, those things can be treated by the palliative care team. And palliative care can be provided by non-specialists but those who provide it as part of a palliative care team in hospitals, and by the way, over 90% of hospitals 
um, with over 300 beds now have palliative care services, uh, which is really important. And they must have them in New York according to the Palliative Care Access Act, which we're going to discuss in a moment. So that there, this kind of care can and should be provided. And it's something for you to think about if and when you or a loved one is hospitalized. And if it appears as though you or your loved one might need and benefit by palliative care, you should ask for a palliative care consultation. So that will happen because again, too many healthcare professionals, although well, they may be really good at providing you good, good care and treatment generally and diagnosing and curing your illness, they may not be so good when it comes to having discussions with their patients about, uh, about their options and also about providing good care to relieve pain and other symptoms and to address the other issues that I've been mentioning. So the Palliative Care Access Act is a law which is unique to New York State. And what it does is it provides that all hospitals, nursing homes, uh, special needs assisted living centers, home health care agents in New York State must have policies and procedures in place to provide palliative care services to patients who might benefit who are seriously ill. And that includes offering pain management services to patients, as well as to offering different palliative care options and alternative options, and discussing the risks and benefits of those options so that patients can make informed decisions for themselves, or if they have lost decision-making capacity, their healthcare agent or healthcare surrogate, which is the term that's used for the person making decisions under the Family Healthcare Decisions Act, can make decisions for them consistent with their wishes or in their best interest if the healthcare agent or surrogate does not know what their wishes are. Let me just step back for one moment. There was one thing I didn't mention which is important with regard to making decisions about artificial nutrition and hydration. The law right now does require that if you are going to make any decisions on artificial nutrition and hydration as a healthcare agent, you have to reasonably know what the patient's wishes are. If you don't, then you cannot make decisions in any regard with regard to artificial nutrition and hydration. There are bills pending in the New York State Legislature, which I hope are going to be enacted, which would change the law so that you could make decisions just on artificial nutrition and hydration, just like with regard to any other life-sustaining treatments based on a patient's best interest in terms of what you decide is in the best interest of the patient. Uh, but for now, we have to rely on what's in existence. Okay, so Palliative Care Access Act is a very important law, pretty unique to New York State, but it enables patients hopefully to get good palliative care when they can benefit by it uh, when they're in a hospital or nursing home senate or uh, um, when they're in, in one of those places or uh, they're in a home in, at home being cared for by a healthcare agency. Um, the Palliative Care Information Act was passed also in 2010 uh, and that's a, a law which I actually initiated so I'll take some credit for it but it, what it does uh, is that it requires that once an attending healthcare professional, either a doctor or nurse practitioner, makes a determination that a patient is terminally ill and is likely to die within the next six months, that healthcare professional must offer the patient information and counseling on their palliative care and end of life options that would be appropriate for that particular patient given their circumstances. If the patient does not have decision-making capacity, their healthcare agent or surrogate has to be offered that information and counseling. Now, you might think that doctors are ethically required and maybe even legally required to make this offer of, to provide this kind of information and counseling now, even without the law. Well, doctors and nurse practitioners have been obligated to do this, but so many of them have not carried out that responsibility. Why? 
again, because in medical schools, nursing schools, social work schools, most healthcare professionals have not been trained or trained well when it comes to palliative care, hospice, end of life care, and having these difficult end of life discussions with patients and or family members. So this law was necessary in order to hopefully ensure that when a patient is terminally ill, he or she would understand what options exist, what the risks and benefits are of those various options so that the patient can make informed decisions for him or herself, or again, if the patient does not have decision-making capacity, then their healthcare agent or surrogate can make informed decisions for the patient. Some patients, again, will want to continue to live no matter how much suffering they might be enduring, even if they are bedridden, even if they're incontinent, even if they are suffering from advanced dementia. But most people would probably prefer at some point not to have continued life-sustaining treatments um, and would prefer to have a better quality of life rather than an extended life. But these are decisions which you can make according, in accordance with the Palliative Care Information Act uh, if and when you or a loved one is terminally ill. And I should mention that I do think that there are a couple of options which should be available to patients when they're terminally ill. Uh, if they are suffering terribly and they feel they can no longer go on living. A first instance is when they have terrible pain, which can't be controlled by any reasonable means. In that case, a patient may be entitled to receive palliative sedation, which means that they will be sedated to unconsciousness, life-sustaining treatments will be withdrawn, and they will be kept comfortable until, usually until death, which results within about 10 to 14 days. The cause of death is de dehydration, uh, and deaths are usually hastened by a very short period of time. Unfortunately, again, too many patients are unaware of this option. It's not offered to patients as it should be, but now you know that it's something which exists and which you might be able to take advantage of if you are suffering terribly from pain or other symptoms. It could be breathlessness, it could be diarrhea, constipation, whatever it might be. A second option is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Voluntarily stopping eating and drinking occurs when a patient, again, feels that he or she can no longer go on living, has had enough, and so he or she decides that to stop completely taking fluids and nutrition. It is not starvation. The person dies usually again within about 10 to 14 days of dehydration. It is a relatively peaceful death for most people, although it's difficult to stop taking fluids for the first few days. It's not so difficult to stop eating. At a point when people are terminally ill and relatively close to the end of life, uh, I'm not a cl clinician, but my understanding is that appetite is lost and people are really not discomforting. It's not discomforting for those people, although it's difficult not to take fluids. So a person has to be determined to go through this process uh, and there has to be a consistent determination which lasts until the person becomes uh, unconscious, which will happen over a period generally of a few days you'll need to be getting palliative care or hospice support. It's critically important because at the point when you become unconscious, you will need that kind of support. Uh, it is a process which we've helped a number of patients with. There are studies which show that it's actually a peaceful way of dying. One study in Oregon that was conducted in 2003 with over 100 hospice nurses who had 100 patients who had died in this manner found on a scale of one to nine uh, that they're, uh, in terms of the quality of death, they rated the quality of death as an eight and a half, which is a very, very good death. Okay, so uh, at the very end of life, uh, hospice is available for patients, but unfortunately hospice is underutilized across the nation and particularly in New York State. 
across the nation, about 50% of people who die are enrolled in hospice. In New York State, disgracefully, it's only about 30%. There are many reasons for this, um, probably, uh, but it is clear that doctors are not offering their dying patients the option of hospice as they should, either at all or on a timely basis. And so what happens is that even those patients who do enroll in hospital in hospice, most will die two thirds within 30 days and one third within one week. So this is something for you to know about because it's extremely important in terms of your getting um, really good care at the very end of your lives. Most people do not realize hospice is not a place where you go to get um, to get care treatment, although there are hospitals which have hospice beds, there are freestanding hospices, there's Calvary Hospital, which is very much like a hospice. But what does hospice do? Well, it provides excellent quality of care, generally speaking, to patients and family members with the goal of enhancing quality of life at a time when people are continuing to live, even though they're also dying. And remember, we're all living until we take our very last breaths. And so hospice addresses all the physical, psychological, and spiritual needs of the patient. And it's a philosophy of care. And it's provided, again, by an interdisciplinary team, just which is similar to the palliative care team that's, that's in, in hospitals and nursing homes. So the hospice team is consists of a physician, nurse, nurse practitioner, social worker, chaplains, bereavement workers, AIDS therapists, all of whom have been trained to work with people with terminal illnesses and volunteers as well. Hospice is covered by most insurance, by Medicare. It's also covered by Medicare and most private insurance. And what specific services does hospice provide? Well, there are many. Patient support and comfort, including pain, and other symptom control, medical and social assessment, nursing visits, individual family and group psychosocial and spiritual counseling, the provision of necessary medications, equipment, supplies, support for caregivers, dietary and nutritional advice, homemaking and home health assistance. You can only get, unfortunately, right now, 20 hours of home health care unless you can provide for it yourself. Uh, it also provides for grief and bereavement support for family members for at least a year following the death of the patient. Hospices are highly rated, much higher than, than hospitals and nursing homes. And if anybody can stay in their own home, it's a, it's a tremendous benefit to be around loved ones at the time that you are continuing to live at the same time that you are dying. Your own doctor can continue to, to treat you as, as well as the hospice doctor, and you're not giving up hope if you're in hospice. While you have to give up um, continued care, which is um, life-sustaining care, um, you're still going to be hoping for a reasonable quality of life, the best quality of life possible for you and your loved ones. So now hope is, has turned from curative goals of care to maintaining and improving quality of life, time with your family and with loved ones, comfort care, and really finding dignity in each day. Sometimes a hospice patient condition improves to the point that they are no longer considered terminally ill, in which case hospice care is no longer appropriate. But at some point, it might be appropriate again. And you can stop hospice anytime you want. You're in control as long as you have decision-making capacity. You can switch hospices. It's totally up to you. So hospice, again, in general, is a wonderful benefit, which is not being taken advantage of nearly enough uh, by people who are terminally ill. All right, the last things I'm going to talk about are for people who are near the end of their lives who have decided that they have had enough. And so what can they do in terms of having a peaceful death? Well, there are several ways in which people can, in fact, hasten their deaths. We all know about life-sustaining treatment. Well, if you are on life-sustaining treatment, that treatment can be stopped at any time, whether it's a feeding tube or a ventilator, dialysis, a pacemaker, uh, antibiotics, they can all be stopped. And they can, you don't have to start any of them if you don't want to. 
Now, it's difficult to have these things stopped once started, but it is your decision. Healthcare professionals have a hard time accepting their patient's decision sometimes when the patient has decided that they have had enough and want life-sustaining treatment stopped. But if you have decision-making capacity, this is your right. The same is true of your healthcare agent. They can make these decisions for you, except with regard to artificial nutrition and hydration. A second way of um, hastening your death is, as I mentioned before, palliative sedation, although it really only hastens your death by a short period of time. A third way is voluntarily stopping um, eating and drinking. And then we have created a directive for those people who have advanced dementia, who while they still have decision-making capacity can make decisions about their future in terms of being hand-fed uh, when they have advanced dementia. And we have two different options, which you can see are available uh, on the sheet that's available to you. And we counsel people on uh, how to exercise their right with these different options. The one option which says that they would never want to be hand fed under any circumstances, we're not sure about its legality. We know of one nursing home who has said they're not going to recognize this right. We are now in uh, dis legal discussions. And so the, this may have to be determined by the courts or by the, the New York State Legislature. We're also working on legislation to hopefully ensure that people who have, are suffering from advanced dementia have the right to make a decision not to be hand fed at a point when they can no longer uh, feed themselves if that's what their wishes are. The last thing I'm going to talk about very briefly and then open it up to questions uh, is medical aid in dying. Medical aid in dying occurs when a terminally ill patient um, decides, uh, asks for a prescription of medication from their physician who then has to determine along with a consulting physician that the patient is terminally ill and has decision-making capacity. Uh, if, if that determination is made after an oral and a written request are made, the written request being witnessed by two people who have determined that the patient is of sound mind uh, and uh, is, is not being coerced into doing this. Uh, at that point, the physician can prescribe life-ending medications that the patient can take at a time and place of his or her choosing if he or she decides to do this. Now, some people consider this to be assisted suicide. We do not think that it is. In fact, we are clear that it is not. Suicides occur by people who could continue to live but choose not to. They are usually done in isolation by people who have a psychological or psychiatric illness. They are often done violently, and when they occur, it is usually tragic. To the contrary, those who use medical aid in dying are people who have gone through a thoughtful process, which usually takes several weeks in consultation with family members and their doctors. They do so openly. They do so um, not in isolation. Uh, it's not in any way violent, of course, and they are not, um, they are not suffering from a psychological illness uh, or psychiatric illness. And it is empowering for those people and usually for family members. Laws have existed in this state over a 50-year period cumulatively, including for the last 20 years plus in Oregon, over 10 years in Washington, and what has been found by studies is these laws worked as they have been intended. There are many safeguards to ensure that, uh, that patients are protected as well as healthcare professionals. There is no evidence of serious abuse or any uh, disproportionate impact on vulnerable populations. There is no evidence of a slippery slope in the making. Again, this is only for terminally ill people. The vast majority of our citizens, including some 63% of New Yorkers, support medical aid in dying, as do 67% of doctors who have actually looked at the Medical Aid in Dying Act, a bill that's pending in the New York State Legislature, who support the act itself. Uh, if, you looked at the, if you look at the law, it, the bill, it provides numerous, numerous safeguards 
Um, and when you consider this process, when people have to go, when people decide to end their lives by other means, whether it's withdrawing or never starting life-sustaining treatments, or by voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, they don't have to go through a process like this. There always, of course, should be a process to ensure that there's nothing more that can be done to improve the patient's quality of life. If the patient is suffering from pain, of course, we want their pain controlled. If they're suffering from depression, we want that depression controlled or anxiety. We want to make sure that they are having the best quality of life possible. And if, if there's nothing more that can be done, then we think that patients should have the right to medical aid in dying. We are advocating for it. Uh, and there are two local legislators in the, uh, in the Dutchess County area, uh, Senator Harkham, uh, who's, who is a sponsor of the Medical Aid in Dying Act, and Assemblyman Cahill, who supports the concept but wants a study bill completed before he will sign on as a sponsor. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we believe uh, that this bill, which now has over or some 40 assembly sponsors, as well as some dozen Senate sponsors, uh, is going to ultimately going to be enacted. And we hope it is so that people who are at the very end of their lives do not have to needlessly suffer. So I'm going to stop here and I will take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. So if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box and I will read them to David. Um, right now I have a few questions for you while people get their thoughts together. Um, so just to confirm, you said that um, there's a bill in New York for medical aid in dying, so it's not legal in New York right now, right? That's correct. It's legal David, in did you hear 10 the other um, jurisdictions in the, across the country, uh, okay. in, including, including Oregon, Washington, and, and some of our um, neighboring states, New Jersey uh, and Vermont. Uh, it's, it's legal in those states, uh, and bills are being considered uh, in other neighboring states as well. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned artificial nutrition and hydration. Can you um, define those for us? Yeah, it's usually a feeding tube, uh, which the patient needs because they can no longer feed themselves. And so that feeding tube is inserted okay. and um, and I don't know the, the, tech, the technicalities. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not a clinician, uh, but it's to make sure that the, pa the patient has uh, sufficient nutrition and hydration. Uh, it's sometimes provided to people on a temporary basis after an operation uh, when they can no longer um, feed themselves, when they can no longer take nutrition and hydration by, by some other means. It is sometimes provided to uh, people who... Um, uh, are, have Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, although it's not, from what I understand, useful uh, and beneficial to people who are quite near the end of their lives uh, with advanced dementia and who are frail. Frail, mm -hmm. frail elderly people do not benefit by, uh, by, by a feeding tube. Okay. Um, so we have a question about um, some of these things like healthcare proxies uh, and other states. So we have a question. We are planning to move to North Carolina. Could you comment on how care and other laws in other states uh, compares to New York? And I would also like if you could talk a little bit about the healthcare proxy form being New York specific and how that might play out in other states. Okay, so uh, every state has a healthcare proxy law. They might call it a durable power of attorney or some other thing, but, and they're really quite similar to each other. They may differ in some aspects, uh, but if you're going to move to North Carolina, then certainly you should complete the healthcare proxy form or whatever it's called 
in that state. If you're going to be spending any amount of time in a different state, even though you're a New York State resident, you spend the winters in Florida or Arizona, you should complete the form for that particular state, even though there is reciprocity and states are supposed to honor uh, other states healthcare proxies if they're similar to their own, but they don't necessarily do that because healthcare professionals may not be aware of the laws in that state. So it's much better to complete the healthcare proxy form for any state in which you're going to spend uh, any reasonable amount of time during the course of the year. And then in terms of care and laws in other states, the things you mentioned like palliative care and hospice, these are available across the US, right? They are. Um, there are not enough palliative care programs still uh, in, in New York. They are required, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for um, hospitals and nursing homes and home health agencies. Uh, but that's not the case in, in other states necessarily. So you may, be ha you may have to advocate for yourself or for your loved ones to get the palliative care services, uh, assuming there are palliative care professionals who are available to provide those services. So we have a question and please feel free to keep asking questions. There's no limit on the number of questions you can ask. So the next question, my aunts and uncles have all come to a stop when speaking with their mother about her end of life wishes. Is there a standard verbal guide or script for caregivers or granddaughters to follow when bringing up their end of life plans? Um, I'm not sure if there is really a script, but I, I will suggest to you going to the Conversation Project website, which has a guide uh, for people uh, thinking about having conversations and has a list of things which can be raised in terms of uh, the discussion that might take place with a loved one, no matter what their age is. Um, so it's not easy to have these discussions, but you can say certainly to your loved one, whoever that loved one might be. I, I'm concerned that I don't really know what kinds of health care you would want or not want if you could no longer make your own health care decisions. And I'd like to know so that we can uh, make decisions that would be consistent with what you would want so that you would get care and treatment that you do want and you would not get care and treatment that you don't want. And this is really important because we don't want to be guessing as to what kind of health care uh, you would want or not want. What you, so let's, let's talk about this. Um, so the next question, is a power of attorney the same as a healthcare proxy? No, uh, I am not an expert when it comes to the powers of attorney, but the power of attorney uh, deals with financial matters and it gives someone else the ability and right to make decisions with respect to a person's finances. It has nothing to do, generally speaking, with health care. The health care agent, uh, pursuant to the health care proxy, has the authority and responsibility to make health care decisions only and does not, but does not, is not given the authority or responsibility to make financial decisions. So they are separate documents, and, uh, and, but both very important uh, for people to complete. If I don't have anyone to serve as my healthcare agent, oh, sure, go ahead. Um, would you recommend having both a healthcare proxy and a living will, or is a healthcare proxy generally enough? I think the healthcare proxy and having a healthcare agent is the most important thing to have. So there is actually a person 
who is able to advocate on your behalf and to tell healthcare professionals what your wishes are or to act in your best interests. But for some people, it gives them comfort to also have a living will and it may be good and maybe him or her what the person's values and preferences are. Although those things can also be put into the healthcare proxy document itself if the patient wants to do that. So it's really a matter of a personal preference as to whether someone should have or not living will and whether or not it's going to be beneficial to that, uh, that person uh, if and when the patient loses decision-making capacity. Okay, one more question. So okay. based, based, thank you. <laughs> so based on the handouts, I think the frequently asked questions within them are very helpful. Uh, they help clarify a lot of the documentation. Uh, I also uh, appreciated seeing the remote healthcare proxy witnessing form or information within that set of handouts. Um, now, uh, one section in the most, section D, there was a box that said documentation of oral advanced directives. What is an oral advanced directive as opposed to all these written documents that we are preparing? If the person has actually um, indicated orally what they want or don't want, that that is, is the person's wishes and that must be respected by healthcare professionals. So oral as in meaning they have said it to their agent or their surrogate or that they've said it to the doctor or whoever it's, is helping it's, them. It should be certainly to the healthcare professional. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the background noise. It's uh, we're doing the 7 p.m. cheer for medical professionals and essential workers, so you can hear it maybe coming through from the neighborhood. Um, so, if I don't have anyone to serve as my healthcare agent, how can I still make my wishes known and honored? You can do that by completing a living will. You can also do it by completing a most form, uh, which I think is similar and even better than a living will because it is a medical order, which is signed by a healthcare professional. And it's supposed to travel with you from uh, venue to venue. So from your home to the hospital, to nursing home, back to your own home, hospice, wherever you might be. So it's a, I think it's better actually than most living wills, uh, but, is, but if you want to have a separate living will, you can do that as well. Great. So um, I think that those are all the questions that we have. If we did not get a chance to answer a question, or maybe you would prefer to ask a question privately, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at endoflifechoicesny.org. Again, info at endoflifechoicesny.org or 212-726-2010. Again, 212-726-2010. We also encourage you to visit our website, endoflifechoicesny.org, to learn more and sign up for our newsletter to learn about future activities and events. And also encourage you to visit the Poughkeepsie Library website at poklib.org to access their online resources, including health resources that Bridget went over. And also once the library opens, I hope you will go and visit. Um, before we go, I wanted to let you know about a new service that I mentioned briefly that we're offering, um, our Healthcare Proxy Helpline, our Healthcare Proxy Helpline. It was created in collaboration with the Completed Life Initiative and offers free support to help you complete a healthcare proxy form. We have trained advanced directive advocates that are available by phone or video appointment to answer your questions and guide you through all the different portions of the form. And they are also available to witness the form via video call. End of Life Choices New York successfully advocated for Governor Cuomo to issue an executive order 
allowing witnessing over video call because witnessing in person, which is typically what's required, is not possible during the time of COVID and social distancing. But this order is currently set to expire on June 6th. It may be extended, but since it may not be, we strongly encourage you to make an appointment if you're interested before this date. To learn more about this service or make an appointment, you can visit endoflifechoicesny.org. Again, end of So that concludes our event. Bridget, is there anything else that you would like to say? No, I, I think you have covered everything. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thank you for having us, Bridget. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Lillian. Thank you to the Poughkeepsie Library for hosting this, and thank all of you for joining us and taking the time to learn about your end-of-life care options and rights. And again, we will make sure the recording is available to you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. <laughs>